Hey, hey there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome back. It's another Red Cover Religion podcast, Red Cover Religion, where amongst the things we say are that uh, belief in the supernatural is normal, healthy, rational, and evidence-based. If you like the kind of material we're doing these days, please support our work on redpillreligion.com. In these days of social media censorship, uh, we should be secure in this location. And in fact, we're looking at opening up a private chat server off of the site soon. So keep your eyes tuned out for that. Please, we could also use your donations via PayPal, Bitcoin. We are on Subscribestar. Uh, we are still on Patreon and we might wind up staying. We'll see. Um, because of some changes there recently, I'm not sure, but we could use your support if you like the content we're doing here, which is very cutting edge. We've had provocative interviews lately with E. Michael Jones, with rabbis, with uh, sociologists from the UK. We got a lot going on, and we got some high-profile atheists, professional atheists, who will be coming in soon to debate with Andrew uh, Stratelites and Josh Brister. We always got something going on here. We could use your financial support to keep growing. So, as per usual, however, it is Monday night and it is John C. Wright night. John C. Wright of SciFiWright.com. Say hello to everybody, Mr. Wright, you big nerd. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And just everybody knows, please direct your attention to SciFiWright.com where you can see the latest stuff he's been writing. Actually, what's, what's hot on the blog this week, sir? I just posted an article on the same topic that you and I are going to discuss this evening. Uh, before that, my latest book just came out in paperback, uh, uh, Feasts and Seasons. It's a collection of Catholic and science fiction short stories for any, story. for any overlap of uh, Catholic and science fiction. Yes. And I'm uh, doing a uh, uh, – and my uh, free uh, sample book, Lost and Last Continent, comes out. I drop a new chapter on when, every Wednesday. So if you want to see what uh, Mr. Wright's fiction looks like for free, look for on here for the free book called Lost on the Last Continent, which is up around 80 plus chapters. He's almost done with it. Or do yourself a bigger favor. Just click on the works tab and then go on down and find uh, uh, links to purchase any of his awesome, well-reviewed, many not award nominated and winning uh, science fiction novels, short story collections and such. And if you if if you if you buy all of his books tonight in one fell batch, his wife will bake you a cake. Um, I just made that up, but check out his fiction. He's uh, he's quite a writer. Also, speaking of that, uh, his uh, uh, Mrs. Wright can be found at aljajilamplater.com, who also publishes uh, quite a bit of her own fiction and works as an editor for others. So, John, tonight we are going to talk about evidence. And, and, and you know, this is the thing that this this is this has become my pet peeve that I've noticed even has made it outside of the atheist skeptic connective. And I see this this debate tactic being used. I've seen it in other contexts too, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, where somebody where, where I'll make an, give an opinion or or make an observation, and they'll say you have presented no evidence. And I'm like, excuse me. It took me a while to figure out because that was like a little mind trick for the longest time. I would immediately start trying to justify my position to somebody who said that to me mm -hmm. um, until I finally realized um, the appropriate response is, I'm sorry, you did not ask for evidence. What was it that you wanted evidence for exactly? I, from early on, simply say, what is your standard of proof in such cases? What's your standard of evidence? Of course, I'm a lawyer. And if they say, <laughs> and uh, no one has ever answered the question. Not a single person says, oh, in, in a case like this, it, uh, since you're talking about something that uh, happened 2,000 years ago, obviously I uh, have to rely upon the eyewitness testimonies of anyone who wrote anything down. So you'd have to show eyewitness testimony and uh, a, chain of, uh, a, chain of, a chain of proof of custody. So, That's a good and plug. I, That's a good and plug. Then I, and, then there, I could point, right? and then I could point to that, that evidence. But they never do that. They ever say, I want it to be uh, more likely than not level of evidence, which is the evidence for a, a lawsuit. I want it to be evidence beyond a reasonable doubt, which is evidence for a, uh, for a criminal conviction. Well, well, I want it to be the apodectic evidence of a, uh, uh, that only a philosopher demands for things that are so certain that they cannot be doubted. Okay? And then I merely ask them if their own beliefs in their own head fulfill those standards of evidence. And of course they don't, because atheism is a matter of faith. I uh, let me just back up and just uh, start with 
the fact that you somehow instill instinctively rose to the challenge. What, what I'm increasingly doing when I see that little rhetorical trick, because did you notice the little rhetorical trick in it? You have presented no evidence. Really, the first part is the presumptuousness of that. All I did was make an observation. I'm sorry, were we on trial to you again, Buttercup? Because um, when you smile, well, yes. <laughs> it is, it is a, a rhetorical trick meant to instantly put you on the defensive. I'm like, I'm sorry, I just made an observation. What, what, what was it you required proof for? I really literally had somebody do that to me today when I was critical of Jordan Peterson. Now, I don't want to get into an argument with anybody right now about Jordan Peterson. I'm not saying he's the devil, but uh, I was critical and somebody was like, you presented no evidence for that opinion. I'm like, I was just saying I agreed with what two other people said. What evidence did you need me to present for my opinion? I, it, it's like oh. this, this game starts happening like I, I did something wrong by observing the opinion. I, I don't owe you anything. Um, you see what I'm saying there? You, you got to recognize. Uh, I, I, I do, but it's outside of my it's outside of my mental universe. I understand that, that there is such a thing, but uh, I'm both a philosopher and an attorney, so to me, everything is a, is on trial at all times. Oh, there you go. <laughs> but the question is, but the question is, where's the presumption of guilt? Who's That's got right. the burden of evidence? And who's, and who's and who's the defendant? And who's the prosecutor? If yeah. Nimbus is trying to is trying to question all of Western civilization. Then the burden of proof is on him because he's not only in the vast major minority, but he's already received the benefit of the bargain. To, to use a legal term, he's already received what Christianity has to offer to create the scientific revolution, the industrial revolution, and the the laws, morals, and customs of the Western civilization that has so benefited him. So, if he's going to question it, then he's the one who has to give he, he has to justify his otherwise absurd skepticism. I tell you what, I mean, the I, thing is, is that the, what you just put your in the, in the nail in the coffin, uh, uh, or I, some metaphor that escapes me. You just hit the nail on the head. <laughs> I just put, <laughs> hit the nail on the head of the coffin that went as dead as a doornail yes, into like a, a coffin nail. It smoked I, a cigarette, otherwise known as a coffin nail. Yes. I, yes. Um, uh, but the th you're skeptical by nature, sir. That's the thing, and that, that's what happens. Once you get skeptical of certain propositions that so-called skeptics use, it's falling apart. Number one, nobody has a burden of proof to anybody. But really, when skeptic, when skeptics, so-called hey. skeptics say there is no evidence, that's a lie. And while we normally go into the more philosophical proofs of God that could apply to multiple religions, we're just going to go into one right now um, uh, because, especially. John had wanted to talk about this. I'll go ahead and put a, a video that I linked in the low bar because I didn't know what he had in mind. This is a video call from a group called Babylon or Truth. And it's, uh, you know, new forensic evidence validates the Shroud of Turin and the resurrection of the person in it. It's still a couple of years old, though, so at least three years old, maybe older. So why don't you tell me what you saw and where we can find what you saw, sir? Uh, it's, it's linked on my blog. If you, if you bring up my, uh, my blog again, you'll see it is the, uh, it's the second or third article down from the top. Uh, and it's just called Evidence of Christ Rational and uh, Empirical. Now, I... Uh, ah. I because the uh, the matter is uh, uh, the matter of uh, the Christian faith is as complex as um, anything else in life because it is all of life. Uh, it's not purely a philosophical argument. The pure philosophical argument can prove that monotheism is is uh, the most rational conclusion to draw from the order of the universe, from its beauty, from its its moral character and so on and so forth. But that's not gonna get you revealed truth. That's not gonna get you Christianity. You might at least become a deist or something with that right. argument. So you have to look then at what kind of what kind of doubts the person has about Christianity. If if he's doubting the philosophical part, the uh, uh, the Catholics, uh, and I'm, I'm a Catholic, uh, we hold as a matter of uh, uh, faith that a rational argument that, that a man can reason himself to monotheism. Now, uh, we're required to believe that as Catholics. It also happens to be true, and you can you can satisfy yourself of that fact by looking at any any of the ancient philosophers who thought deeply on the matter. Uh, Aristotle and 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 uh, Plato were basically kind of like proto Christians. They came oh, yeah. very close, <laughs> as close as human reason could take them. But if you want to talk about if you want to talk about the uh, the God of the Jews, if uh, the evidence there then is historical. You have to look at the history of the Jews to see what he did. 
in their history. And you can try to look at it and pretend that he didn't do anything or that it was just all natural occurrences, but that then you have to ask whether that uh, whether that theory fits the model better or worse than the theory that they are they were chosen by him for a special purpose and were uh, <laughs> have, have been persecuted for all time because of it. Uh, I myself uh, just think the fact they still exist is is a a, a miracle uh, because where are the Amalekites? Where are the Jebusites? Where are the other where are the other tribes that were around at that time? You know, and uh, anti-Semitism is as old as Egypt. It's as old as Acadia. It, it's you know, it's as old as Mesopotamia. It, you don't even have to wait to get wait, wait for the Jews and the Romans to to hate the. I mean, for the Romans and the Greeks to hate the Jews. Everyone does. <laughs> it's all all history. You know, and uh, my my own church is not is not not clean of that of that stain and as as much as I would like it to be. Uh, that's also a little mysterious. No one else is. No one else fits that. That pattern. Uh, third, the Jews have a story, an account of a Messiah predicted to come. You then have to look at the uh, the evidence of the witnesses who are who are eyewitnesses, see what they say, see if the if the uh, events as pr predicted fulfill the requirements for the Messiah, uh, and make a decision on that. Now, as far as I can tell, that, that, that nothing about this is extraordinary. Uh, deducing from philosophical first principles that monotheism must be correct is no stranger a mental act. It's no, it's no more gullible and no more skeptical than it is to go, there must be such a thing as cause and effect, there must be such a thing as free will, which you can just deduce from first principles. Even if you know nothing else about the universe, just sitting in your armchair with your eyes closed, you can come to those conclusions. And there is, there is certain, the theorem of Pythagoras. If you want to come to historical conclusions about historical events, there you're, you're dealing with a little more uncertainty because there's multiple interpretations, there's uh, uh, evidence decays, uh, times change, uh, some of the writings of the peoples are slanted one way or another. You have to make your best guess as to, as to what's going on. But, if you're, but once again, if you're going to throw out the evidence of what you're studying and say, well, I don't believe, you know, I don't believe the Jews are the chosen people, then you can say, by the same logic, I could say, well, I don't believe Rome was ever founded. Because obviously it's absurd that you know one one race of Italians would conquer the known world and make the make the entire Mediterranean nation their their personal pleasure lake, you know. Well, <laughs> I mean, does that seem reasonable? I mean, if you're going to say, well, I don't believe anything written down in in Livy or Plutarch, or uh, I, I don't believe the archaeological evidence of the uh, the current uh, Italian city of Rome, it's not the same city referred to in these myths and legends. Blah 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 blah. That, that would be insane. That would be madness. Yep. So, so, uh, to, to look at historical evidence, you use the historical standard. And you just apply the same standard to this as you apply to anything else. There's nothing extraordinary about it. The next bit of evidence you look at is, is uh, if you're dealing with a, uh, you're dealing with an account or, a, or a, uh, an explanation for what life is all about. So the t you, you can only deal ba basically with one of two general theories. Maybe three. Let's say three theories. Either Christ is what he, what he said he was, or uh, he's a he's a madman, or uh, the accounts are completely wrong, and either Christ was not never said such a thing, or there was no such person, or uh, he didn't exist at all, and it's all fraud. The whole thing is a fraud from start to finish. Uh, the idea of it being a fraud from start to finish is a very difficult theory to maintain, because if you read Christ's Words right, that have been me, right, tell you what, let me let me let me back you up a little bit, Senator. Sure. And let's let's give some background for let's give up some background for the audience. If anybody does not know, uh, the Shroud of Turin is a supposedly controversial uh, thing, which uh, very clearly. Oh, I was, was going to get to that last. <laughs> I was going right to say the other two types of evidence, and then talk about the physical evidence, because physical evidence, the hard fact things that something you can touch with your finger. Includes things like the Shroud of Turin, and now you can now you can say your piece. Okay, yeah, and it's important that people know what it is. This, even Muslims and Jews, I don't believe in banging them over the head. I don't believe in mistreating them. I don't believe in you know. I have a rabbi come in here, and I don't pounce on him and say, "What do you think of the Shroud of Turin?" Because I don't believe that's how you talk to people. But if you're going to you know just be honest to the forensic science, to the archaeology, uh, the Shroud of Turin is evidence that demands a verdict. 
It truly is. I've heard some Christians disparage it, and I'll tell you why. It's very clear because they have because who holds the the shroud of Sharon? The big bad Catholic Church, and so uh, a certain sec segment of Christians, very small in number but vocal, cast shade on it just for that reason. Um, atheists, ideological atheists, are quick to jump on that. But this shroud, there are common things you'll hear on the internet or search up on on the internet, claiming all sorts of things about this shroud, like it was only dated to the 1200s, and uh, uh, you know it was painted on, and and I think. I I can explain. I can explain both of those false arguments. By the way, let's talk about it because the the shroud definitely, according to multiple credible scientific sources, definitely would date to around the year very very reasonably within the range of the year thirty. Very reasonably within the first century. Uh, multiple, you know, there's some who want to dispute it, um, but quite a bit of forensic evidence points right to the time period. It ha it is the appearance of a large, a tall, thin. Um, um, uh, obviously Semitic nosed man, uh, uh, looks like he's been beaten up, crucified, whipped and tortured and buried, uh, with broken legs. And the shroud is rather uh, amazing. No, no, no. No, no, broken, not legs. Broken, legs? no, no. broken legs. No broken legs. I must've forgotten that. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you for the correction, sir. You're um, and, uh, uh, it, it, it looks very much as if some physical, you know, light or whatever blasted out of it and left like a photographic image of it, which uh, sounds suspiciously, you know, consistent with the gospel account of him rising, of Jesus of Nazareth rising there in the tomb. Um, you know, and I think that's a good base description. And there's a lot of people who've tried to throw shade on it, but they're usually very ineffective. So yeah, now John says that he can he can address one of them, such as the claim that. Well, you're you're, you're let's going start. really quickly. If you if you're going to establish physical evidence, let's establish the chain of custody first. Chain of custody, the, just like the, they put in a courtroom. The early well, it's it's evidence. It's yep. evidence. We're trying to convince the skeptic. Right. Uh, the earliest image we have of someone who saw the shroud and and. Uh, uh, Made a made a copy of it was on a little brass a plaque that exists to this day of people who used to visit it when it was still stored in the Holy Land, and that dates to around the third or second century. I forget exactly when. It was taken by the allegedly taken by the Empress Helena to Constantinople, where it rested for many years. It's only referred to very indirectly, and we don't we're not sure it's a reference to the shroud when when they, when they uh, reference the burial cloth of Christ. The um, uh, However, it is noteworthy that before the Empress Helena uh, took the burial cloth, what, what, what the history records say, she took the burial cloth of Christ uh, and displayed it. Pictures of Christ appearing on mosaics and stuff don't show him as a young man with long hair and a short beard. And then after that date, all the depictions of Christ uh, show him that way, what you think was the normal, uh, traditional way he looks. Well, that's the way he looks on the shroud. Or the man, excuse me, that's the way the man in the shroud looks. We got long hair and a short beard. Okay? So, uh, it's uh, uh, taken during the uh, Crusades, it's taken to France, and that's what, how it ends up in Turin. And the uh, wicked Catholic Church, I have to say, doesn't get their hands on it until uh, the, the 1800s. So, any, any Protestant friends of ours who are, who are dismayed at the idea that the Shroud of Turin is evidence of the burial cloth of Christ, uh, just keep in mind that for uh, 1,800 of those 2,000 years, it was not it, it was not in our hands. Who, who okay. did have it before then? The Archbishop, the, Arch, the Archbishop of, of Turin, or the uh, the excuse me, not, not the Archbishop, the uh, the local Lord there, the, the King there. Oh, oh, okay, the King there. So it was kept in more or less what we would call secular hands. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I thought you might uh, say now, else had here's it. the big thing about the trap. Here's the things that start getting interesting about the trap. First, it's a negative image, not a not a positive image. Second, it it was examined. Uh, someone took a good photograph of it in the 1930s. Took a high quality high quality photograph of it in the 30s. A few years later, in the uh, in the uh, 60s, a NASA scientist put the shroud image through a photographic analyzing machine that NASA had invented to estimate the height and depth of 
a uh, moon uh, uh, saddle of moon, of lunar uh, mountains and uh, valleys based on their light refraction properties. So you get a three dimensional image from the uh, from a picture of a uh, of a face, and the three dimensional image came out of this face. However, when you put an ordinary photograph through the same analysis, you get both uh, um, cylindrical distortions and distortions from the uh, the light source in the room of whatever the phot photographic light source is. So this face, the light source was inside the body, shining outward. Now, just think about that for just a second. It's not something modern science can explain, but the way the light left the body and and struck and discolored the shroud fibers uh, was vertical light radiating out uh, from each cell of the face and, and the whole body. The shroud was covered over the entire body. We usually just see the face when you see pictures on the internet, like the one you're showing now. Right. It actually covered the whole right. body, so you could see all sorts of details. Uh, a close forensic study of it was organized by the church in the uh, late 60s by a team of uh, American uh, scientists uh, operating under an international protocol. They all were skeptics. There was maybe two, uh, two people who were nominally Christian, uh, who were believers on the team. Most of them were, were skeptics. Uh, one was a Jew. Uh, they, they didn't have any particular you know, self-interest involved in, in proving it one way or the other. In fact, they all thought they were going to prove it wrong. They all, they all thought they were going to be able to prove it was paint or something. They examined it. It's not paint. It's not stain. It's not a cloth that was draped over a hot statue. It's not, uh, it, the, the fibers are discolored by radiant energy, like you would get by using a laser beam to partly bake a, a, a one, a, 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 the, the, the shroud is made of linen. Most, the fibers in the linen are made up of about 200 fibrils, which is the smallest element of the fiber. Only the most outermost layer of fibrils of every fiber is actually discolored. Does that make sense? Yep. So the thing was somehow yeah. burned into the cloth, but not burned to within the depth of the, the the whole cloth. Not even burned to the depth of the fiber. There are blood stains on the cloth, and the blood stains are um, redder than normal. The scientists at first thought the blood stains were fake because the blood was too red. Normal forensics are are used to seeing blood turn black after a while. But there's one case where the blood does not turn black, and that case is if the person is suffers severe and extended trauma, so much so that certain blood cells break, and releases a uh, chemical called bili, bili, bili rubin. Bili rubin, which turns the blood very bright scarlet red. So if the guy was tortured to death, his blood would come out very red, especially if he was immediately wrapped up. The blood was not disarranged like you would get if you pulled the body out of a cloth. You've had blood stick to your shirt or something when you've had it, when you've had a wound or a cut. If you pull it away from the shirt, it, it, it disrupts the, the pattern of blood on the shirt. Well, these, these patterns were not disrupted, which means that someone got the body out from the cloth without moving the cloth. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Okay. The blood was bright red because the guy the guy buried in a cloth was tortured to death. Now, if there's a 15th century or 13th century forger who knows how to stain cloth with a radiant energy source that we in our modern day cannot reproduce, uh, uh, decided to put in details such as having, oh, and, and actually stained it with blood, that was the blood contains XY uh, chromosome rate traces showing it was a man. It's a human blood, not monkey blood, because it has it has additional markers that that other primates don't have. And the uh, the forensic evidence of the blood sample shows that he was tortured to death or suffered some other traumatic shock. OK, so this is a really good forge. The forge is willing to torture a volunteer to death to get the blood to throw on the blood stains at a time before anyone knew about Billy Rubin or knew about DNA. Right. Got that? Okay. The uh, as you as you can see on the image you're showing now, you can see his hands folded, but you can't see any thumbs. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is if you drive a oh, and please notice where the wound is on the wrist, not on the palm of the hand. Which is in every religious right. picture, in every picture religious picture I've ever seen in my life, Christ is always shown nailed with a nail going through his palm. That is not historically accurate. The historical record shows that the that the Romans would drive a spike through. Uh, the wrist at a little spot where the wrist joins the uh, 
the two bones that forms a slight gap between the uh, between the uh, forearm bones. And if you drive a spike through there, it cuts the major nerve that controls the thumb, and it makes the thumb fold up, it makes the thumb crinkle. So the guy's thumb is folded behind his hands. The uh, you can't see from the picture you're showing, but the crown of thorns on his head. The, the uh, excuse me, the the pattern of thorn of excuse me, I shouldn't say thorns. The pattern of wounds to the head do not show a line of thorns like you would get if someone took a thorn bush and took twenty minutes or so to weave it, plate it into a nice circle, and then put a circular thorn crown on his head. Every religious piece of art I've ever seen in my life shows the crown of thorns as a circular crown. But if you're a, a Roman soldier and all you're doing is mocking someone, what would you do? You'd pick up the thorn bush and stick it on top of his head like a cap, which is consistent with what is shown in the Shroud of Turin. Uh -huh. So the forger in the Middle Ages not only shows our Lord and Savior naked, because the guy's not wearing a loincloth, he doesn't have a fig leaf covering his naughty bits, and he doesn't show the nail in a way that anyone in those days would put the nail if they're trying to, to make a forgery for the local archbishop. Especially because the word, the word for hand in the in the Greek language that it was written Correct. in. Correct. It includes it includes everything from the elbow to the forearm. Right. Right. Now, there's microscopic traces of pollen on this shroud. Guess where it's from? It's pollen from Jerusalem that occurs in no other place. Three 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 thirty percent of it. Specifically, from a certain type of thorn bush ah. that occurs only in Jerusalem. Now, is our medieval forger, who doesn't even know about the invention of the microscope, going to find a, and and drape his shroud in the pollen of the thorn bushes of Jerusalem? That many centuries also, ago. That many centuries there's, ago. There is also pollen from uh, Turkey around the area that is of Byzantium, Constantinople. Where, where the Empress Helena allegedly had it. There's also some from southern France, where the where the, the Lord of the, where the Lord of Turin owned it for a while. So you, you got all those where those pollen counts come from? Because no no place on the world has the exact same pollen count of the exact same types of plants. Especially and the, the shrub that grows only in Jerusalem and nowhere else in the world is found on this shroud. So the so the shroud comes from Jerusalem. Now the uh, examination of the body by of the of the image of the body by forensic uh, uh, scientists shows that the rigor mortis is set in. So that's like about two hours after his death. You can count the whip marks on his back because the, the image is clear enough to do that. And the whip marks show a tall man from his left and a short man to his right. One was beating him with a Roman flail and the other one was beating him with a reed. The Roman flail is a long whip that has a metal uh, barbell shaped uh, weight at the end to lend additional pain for, to the stroke. Did anyone in the 11th century know about the construction of a 1st century Roman flagellum? The answer is no. Okay. Much less was able to burn the, 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 the almost microscopic marks into the shape of the, of the whip wounds. The whip wounds cover his back and also curve around to his upper arms uh, and, and legs, as you would expect if a man was bent over with his hands tied in front of him to a pillar so there's no whip marks on his forearms or hands because they, they would have been out of reach of the of the length of the whip. Uh -huh. Now, is that kind of detail? Is that the thing that you think a forger would, would, would know about? There is one nail a piercing through both feet, which is consistent with the with the biblical account. And there's, there's a no, wound. No, yes? I just want to say, because you're going on and on, and, and you might almost be uh, giving people too much information at once, because I know <laughs> it's astounding how much it comes down. There is no known technology by which you could replicate this thing. No. The there closest isn't. we have gotten, the closest we've gotten is I took a, a high energy laser and managed to, by tuning the laser down, burn just a few fibers into a linen cloth. And he deduced that if you had uh, a battery of 500 or so lasers and the enough energy to power the city of greater Manhattan, uh, you, could, you could possibly make such an image using that methodology. But this is not a photograph. It's not paint. It's not burn marks. It's not anything that we have seen before. I, Moreover, I, oh, wait, wait, I'm nowhere near done. <laughs> Moreover, <laughs> when it was carbon dated, the Ita an Italian team of scientists decided to ignore the international protocol that the Americans had been working under. You can. I leave it to your speculation as to why they decided to. It was. It was taken from one corner. Wait, I'm not done. It was taken from one corner of the shroud. 
This is the same corner that, according to the earlier historical record in the 15th century, the woman who gave the shroud to the Lord of Turin wanted to keep a piece of it for her own personal devotion, and she cut it from a corner. Now, after the examination from just that one corner of the radiocarbon dating was done, the carbon-14 dating, the uh, international community, it was, it was sent to five different labs, and they all agreed this was between the uh, 12th and 13th century dated, the radiocarbon dating. So the Shroud of Turin was internationally de de denounced as a fraud. It was debunked. And everyone uh, laughed and folded up their, their brains and went home. Uh -huh. Except for one woman who kept staring at photographs of it years later. This is not a trained scientist. She's just a nurse. And she kept looking at the, she found as many photographs as she could on, uh, 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 that she could get her hands on and looked at them under a, micro, uh, under a uh, magnifying glass. She eventually saw something in the weaving pattern of the, the shroud. She saw that the in that one corner that the sample is taken from, the weaving pattern is slightly different. Cotton and linen fibers are mingled together in that pattern, and they're not as thickly woven as the rest of the shroud. And the other part of the shroud is pure linen. Okay. Got that? Okay. So right. she, phoned up, she phoned up the uh, scientist who was in charge of the American team. Now, this guy was used to being harassed by all sorts of uh, people who wanted him to, to say the shroud was not a fraud, and some of them might have been crackpots, so he was very wary. Sure. And he said dismissively that in 15 minutes, since he kept his version of the samples, they were upstairs, and he kept his records and his photographs, he could go check, and in 15 minutes he would come back and call her phone, back on the phone and tell us that it was a fake. So he goes away, an hour goes by, two hours goes by, five hours goes by. He comes back on the phone, calls the lady back, and says, you're right, it's a repair job. It looks like the handiwork of the of the uh, of the 13th century tapestry weavers of France, who were the best tapestry weavers in history. They had glued one fiber to fiber to make the repair, one fiber at a time. Wow! And, and they could detect traces of the glue, and they could detect the difference in the fibers. So when they retook samples from from the from different places on the shroud and sent them to be radiocarbon dated, they dated back to the first century. Got that. There you so go. if you've heard reports this is a fraud, those reports were wrong. That's now, right. let's say let's notice one other thing. The back version, the back image, does not show any distortion of the buttocks or the legs, which means that when this image was taken, and I should say, the darker parts of the image mean that that part of the body was closer to the shroud surface than the lighter parts, and the, and the, and the distance was between one inch and five inches. So like where touching his nose, the nose is the darkest place, or touching his chin, but where his neck is, it's it's less dark, and his ears don't show at all. Right. See what I'm saying? Yep. But if you look at the buttocks and the legs, there's no distortion. Like you would get if you sat someone on top of a, uh, let's say they were sitting on top of a Xerox machine and wanted to photocopy their own moon. You, the, 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 If you sit on the glass, your butt flattens out slightly. Right. If you laid a dead body on stone, the, butt, the buttocks would flatten out slightly. These are not flattened out at all, which means the body was levitating le between one and five inches above the stone when the uh, radiant energy, whatever it was, left the body and and uh, discolored the cloth. We don't know of any process that can do that. The And I think I mentioned the blood marks. Oh, and I should say, this radiant energy did not penetrate the blood marks. The blood stains on the, on the, on the shroud. There's blood stains around the head. There's blood stains around the, the uh, between the fourth, uh, fourth and fifth <clears throat> rib, and there's blood stains around the arms and blood stains from the whip marks. All right, question. If you I dial don't... down, if you dial down X-rays to a really low energy, they won't penetrate blood stains. Penetrate into like a linen cloth or something. When the when the portions of the cloth underneath the blood were examined under a microscope, there was no discoloration. In other words, the radiant energy. Did not pass through the blood of the man on the shroud. Got that? Also, I think I already mentioned the blood was not cracked or creased or flaked away or disturbed the way it would be if the the dead man woke up and, and, and opened the shroud or, or pushed it aside to stand up, or if rave robbers took the body out of out of the uh, out from underneath it. it would be more consistent with the body simply vanishing. It's, it's consistent with the body simply vanishing, which is really difficult to understand. So, 
the uh, <laughs> the other thing is the wound in the side is uh, if you take blood and expose it to air, it forms what's called a, a, a plasma, as the as the uh, as the platelets and such in the blood decay. But if you don't expose it to air, it it, it, it separates the, the red blood cells fall to the, the bottom, and white liquid comes it falls to the top. Okay. Now, if you are a severely wounded man and you start to get blood into the cavities of the uh, uh, there, there's a sac around your lungs that that helps you that helps you breathe. If that was filled up with blood so that you you choke to death, and someone stabbed you with a spear, what would come out would be red blood and then water. Which was found on the shroud, but that kind of blood fluoresces under ultraviolet light with a different reaction than the blood that comes out normally from just being whipped or having nails driven through your hands. You got that? Yeah. So the the thirteenth century forger, who we will call Forgerello, the most the most brilliant forger of all time, not only got a not Ficarelli. Ficarelli, Ficarelli, Ficarelli Forgerello. Not only did he get a volunteer to be whipped to death and crucified to death <laughs> and go into rigor mortis to be slipped under the shroud and be disintegrated, but he also knew enough about ultraviolet lighting to get it so that the correct wound, the, the correct type of blood that he painted carefully one brush stroke at a time on the fibers uh, managed to fluoresce correctly under UV light because he knew about ultraviolet light. Okay. Right. Now, do do I have to do I have to list the number of sciences uh, I've just referenced just in my, the last ten minutes of me right. talking about the shroud? <laughs> yeah, the amount of forensic science evidence here is pretty overwhelming. You you know, yes. you can yes. refuse to dig, take, make a verdict, but I don't know that you get a an I don't know on this. Something very like the Christian account is what happened here. And oh, it is let evidence. Me mention, let no. me mention one, uh, one more one, thing. One more thing, this, then I have a question, then I want to move and this, on. And this is the one I like the best. If you examine the face closely, you can see that the cheek is swollen, as if he was struck on the cheek, which is mentioned in the biblical account. But there's one thing the biblical account doesn't mention. This guy has a broken nose. Okay. Now, that's consistent with a Roman beating or any beating. But why would the forger put that in, that little detail? Yeah. Uh, it's not mentioned in the, it. Yeah. Right. Makes sense. Makes sense. And by the way, I keep forgetting, it, it, his legs weren't actually broken, right? Uh, they were They were curled up because of rigor mortis, and there was one nail through both feet, and that nail, the, 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 uh, the broken nail shows on the, uh, shows on the image. Right. Okay. Was he? Did he have his legs broken in the gospel account? I can't remember nope. now. No, no, nope. that's right. They were in gone. Fact, in fact, the fact that it was not is the typical Roman practice to break the legs of the prisoners so they will die more quickly as more of their weight is put on their arms. The Roman practice was to put a little stand under the guy's toes so that when the agony of having all his his uh, lungs, uh, as his arms are torn out of the sockets by his own weight and his lungs begin to fail and he's choking to death, he can push himself up by his toes and gasp for slightly more breath, and it makes it longer for him to die, because then right. when his legs get weak again, he has to collapse again, and he starts to choke again. So it's the, the Roman practice that when they were feeling kind, they would break the prisoner's legs in order to make him die faster. But according to the biblical account, when they went to break Christ's legs, he had already given up the ghost, because they had basically beaten him so severely that he couldn't walk. Uh, oh, i got to mention one other thing. All right, then you're done. Do you remember? <laughs> then I'm done. I swear, it's the last thing. In every piece of religious art I've ever seen, when you see Christ carrying the cross, what is he carrying? Or Simon of Cyrene, if you want to be, if you want to be specific. A big cross-shaped piece of wood, right? Yeah. That's not the Roman practice. They only had made you carry the cross piece. They would tie your arms to it. They didn't drive the nails in at that time. So, and this man has vertical slashes across his shoulders and arms of where the friction of rubbing, carrying just a a giant piece of wood tied to his arm, tied with shoulders, had been because the Romans would make you walk carrying the cross piece over your shoulders. They would hoist you up and put you on top of the uh, the upright, and then you would then you slowly choke to death so he because was, your arms. He, were he, the he, toward the end, he was too weak even to carry that. Correct. Correct. Uh, so they. Okay. Now, did the forger know that? Did does anyone you know know exactly how the Roman practice of crucifixion was? If they're not a historian. 
If you or I were going to do this, I did not know about where the nails went, for example. I, I, I never, yeah. It never would have occurred to me. I, it never would have occurred to me to make the, the crown of thorns a calf rather than a crown. But yeah, of course, the, the Greek word for hand. hand. The Greek word for hand includes the, you know, the forearm and the wrist. It does. Oh yeah, I know that. Uh, I know that. Yeah, but I, I thought, should I know that because know. even still, the traditional art puts it through the wrist. I've known about yep. this since the '80s, actually, but that's a, that's that's not a crag. It's just I, I thought the nail went through the uh, between the radius and the ulna. I thought it went lower on the forearm. Uh yeah. I mean, I, I, I knew that it couldn't be the palm of the hand because obviously you can't support your weight of a of a whole body through one nail on the palm right. of the hand. So this is evidence. Something happened here, something supernatural here, something miraculous, which science has no explanation for. And if some scientist says, some so-called scientist says, well, just because you have no scientific explanation, that doesn't mean you get to declare it supernatural. I would say no, actually, when you've left out all natural possible explanations, you are left with the supernatural. And since it's rational to believe in the supernatural, it is rational to come to well, a conclusion. He's not even making a, he's not even making a proper argument there. That's right, that's uh, right. And now scientist, uh, as a scientist, all he can say is, what does the evidence point at? But this is a legal, not a scientific argument. Because you're looking at the testimony evidence of what's also written down by eyewitnesses. Then you're comparing the testimony evidence to the physical evidence and seeing whether it matches or whether it doesn't match. And there's that's not a scientific, scientific evidence. That's not a scientific, that's not a scientific question. The scientific question is only whether the physical evidence is consistent with the with, with what's being claimed about it. And then the, the scientist shuts up. Yes, and the but, evidence but, but examining the eyewitnesses and examining their testimony and establishing chain of custody. That's not science. That's either history or legal thinking. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, you can you can do something you might call some kind of scientific analysis on it. But I mean, the forensic science here is overwhelming and it matches eyewitness testimony. Yeah. So it is perfectly rational. That's and all, true. But by the way, that doesn't mean you immediately yep. come to become a Bible thumper or anybody or anything like that. Anybody who wants to get a serious yeah. thing like this should put real thought into it though. Huh? The only thing these things do, the only the only reason to argue with anyone about religion is to shut down uh, their faith in irreligion. It's to make it so that their irrational doubts cannot be supported. They that go is away. Correct, because I'm once gonna... their irrational once their irrational doubts are gone Either the Holy Spirit moves or it doesn't, and it's not up to us. You can't talk a person into falling in love. No, and and so again, uh, and and what this I tell you, I would say that what this evidence does, and nobody gets to declare, declare it not evidence anymore. Sorry, you're done. If you say it's not evidence, you lie. Yeah, you lie. Um, and so you want you must also a rational person would have to agree with at least one proposition that. A rational mind could conclude that this was, in fact, the resurrection of Jesus Christ taken uh, with a physical uh, photograph, essentially, that would be impossible for humans to make. A rational person could conclude that. You haven't concluded that, but you should be able to admit that a rational person would conclude that. And, you know, laughing like, <laughs> your miracle hasn't been authenticated. To what level? Of authentication do you require we have forensic science we have stuff that matches up with external sources contemporaneous to the time as to what pra Roman practice was we have the gospel accounts that are internally self contingent that all match with it what the hell do you want and, from us? what is evidence and, in your mind and it's a comparative it's a comparison of the theory that it is what it says what, what people claim it is versus the theory that it's a fraud but the theory that it's a fraud would involve a greater miracle than a, merely a man re being resurrected from the dead. And I'm going to because admit, because then that requires time travel, forensic science, gathering pollen from Jerusalem. Fakarelli is a god if he can do all these things to fake up the Shroud of Turin in the 13th or 12th century. Yeah, god. it's outrageous what he can do. He's Loki from okay. the Avengers. He can do all that. <laughs> 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 Speaking yep, of which, yep. I'm going to change. So, the and that's why, and that's why I have to insist that when you're arguing with sure. people and say, "What's your evidence?" The the answer also has to be, "What are the op What are the other options? What are the other possible theories? What what coherent theory are you offering as a better theory than the theory that everyone has believed for all time for the last two thousand years that all rational men have believed? You're the one who's claiming the world is flat, not us. We're wow. agreeing with what everyone else has said for all time.
There you go. We have the default rational possession. Now I'm going to do something to, press, to upset some, but not all of our Protestants. And I haven't even gone through all the types of proof I'm talking about. The yeah, fact that this can give me a if, chance. If, the, I, Ford, if I ever get a chance to do my thing, I want to do my thing. <laughs> um, I had a list, and I didn't get to check everything off it. Go ahead. All right. I want to talk about another thing, a completely different thing that will also interest you, John, and that you'll be able to get just as geeked out about. We've only got about 10 minutes left, I think. Um, so sorry. We, yeah, it's all right. Um, we could we could go on the Lady of the Gal Guadalupe the next week, though. We might. We could possibly spend an entire hour on it because lately, you know, the Red Pill religion team is not all Catholic. I, I already nope. hear people saying, boo, his Catholic, boo, his Catholic. Not at all. However, we all are what we might call medieval Christians. Uh, well, no, not all of us, because we've even got a few non-Christians. But, I mean, of those of us, we are very top-heavy with what uh, Dave the Distributist calls medieval Christians or Look, what I call all, little, little all, Orthodox Christians. All Christians and, of all denominations believe that Christ was buried, otherwise you're not a Christian, and they believe that Christ rose, otherwise you're not a Christian. <laughs> this crowd, right. even though it's in the clutches of the evil pope of evil in evil land, still is evidence that the, the account in the Bible is correct. And I'm going to tell you all about it. Yeah. Biblical inerrantists should be more pleased, even than Catholics, that it that it proves our case. I want to make a case about this for for anybody who's quailing because it's time people listen to this. Um, the earliest the the law. All, the majority of non-Catholic Christians believe the, basically what the Catholics do. So right there, please deprogram me from the notion that most that this is all just Catholic invention. We can show you that the majority of Christians who are not Catholics endorse most of what we're going to say, including her perpetual virginity. I'm sorry, we can show you in Scripture, using a King James Bible if you want, why it's not possible that she had other kids with Joseph. And because it isn't scripturally possible, you just have to be able to understand them right. We'll show you scripturally. I'll show you scripturally with a King James Bible why Mary has to be the Queen of Heaven, um, and I will show you why the vast majority of Christians have all believed this, even non-Roman Catholics. And it happens to be that you know the Assyrian Orthodox, the Oriental Orthodox, including the Coptics being slaughtered right now, the Assyrians being slaughtered by us right now, separated from Rome 1600 years ago, still hold all these basic doctrines. Also the Eastern Orthodox, also the Anglicans, and a respectable number of open-minded Protestants, and even some evangelicals are discovering the wonders of Our Lady. And this is important because this is also witness, witness to Christ. We don't have a lot of time, so maybe we will this one next time. Even the Muslims have a real respect for the they her, respect her. her. Well, they don't they don't they don't really know who she is but they've got a pretty good idea they, they got a, in the right direction they really like her um the uh the, the bottom line is is this is a this is actually argue in some ways at least as miraculous as the uh, Shroud of Turin, and I'm not kidding. The entire the entire tale uh, is is hard to tell, and maybe we will save it for next let's week. Save, let's save it next week. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Tell that people I, a few. That's, that's all right. right. I'm going to tell people just a few things about this. This okay. came off of a man's cloak. Uh, actually, not even a, a cloak. A cheap, cheap cactus fiber, something called a toba, which is basically like a toba made out of cheap cactus. <laughs> cactus fiber, um, which would only generally last a year or three. Um, it's now, you know, four or five hundred years old. Um, it should have come apart. There is no explaining this image. There are so many things about this image that are unexplainable, including things like the fact that, uh, you know, nobody can identify any paint that's on it. Um, it has, uh, it has, uh, features on it that are found in, in nature, uh, in, only in certain insects and stuff, which is that it changes color depending on how close or far you are from it. Um, uh, a painter who was doing renovation work in, 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 the, in the place where it was stored accidentally spilled like turpentine or whatever all over it and ruined it and it healed itself. Um, it's, yeah, there's lots of neat things about this image, and there's a w reason why Catholics, not just Mexicans, but uh, 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 Christians around the world, including high church Anglicans, including Eastern Orthodox, some of whom are critical of Catholics, but then you'll find them flying this in Eastern Orthodox churches down in Mexico, because uh, they know how much they love Our Lady. And this is Christian witness. I mean, she's even pregnant with our Lord in this picture, which means she, Jesus Christ is right there in the middle of that photo. 
Um, and we're going to talk about it next week because I love geeking out to Our Lady. So, and, and Christians, even if you're not going to become Catholic, please get to know her. You're wrong. Okay. You're just <laughs> wrong. All of you, Quakers, Baptists, uh, Lutherans, freaking Christian scientists, you're wrong. They're only wrong where they disagree with you received knowledge. They're right about 90% of it. I mean, they, the points of agreement are much greater than the points of disagreement. That's true for all heresies. And they're missing one of Christ's greatest gifts to us. He gave they us are. mom. She's our mom. And that makes him our brother. It's so when, awesome. All when right. I, when I was an atheist, the reason why I became Catholic instead of some of the denominations, because all of the denominations, while they agree with the Catholics on the basics, they leave out things and you don't get the fullness of all the gifts that God's trying to, to give you. They don't have all the sacraments. They don't have as beautiful cathedrals. They don't have uh, as, as uh, organized a theology. It, it just goes on and on. But I would be happy if, if it, compared to being an atheist, being an atheist is being in the desert, man. It's it's You live in a world where everyone around you is a crazy person who believes in Santa Claus, and you think you're the smartest thing that ever walked the earth. And you're not. It's it's a false worldview. It's a false effects worldview. It is. It is. And it is. there is a supernatural element, and cutting yourself off from it is, is like cutting off part of your own oxygen supply to your brain. I'm telling you, it makes you dumber when you're close to these things. All right, everybody, listen, this has been fun. We will be here back next week, and uh, we have stuff here every single night. We might even do an atheist response video this week to something stupid PBS came for. I might enjoy John, ask John to join us for one of those one that time. He might like it. But anyway, uh, everybody, please give us a like. Give us a subscribe. Tell your friends or enemies. Find us on redpillreligion.com. Visit sci-fi-right-not.com. And God bless everybody. Ave Maria.